Okay, so can you see that? Yep, let's get started. Cool, okay. Right, good evening, or well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Steph Evans, and I run EvoTech Computer Edge Engineering based in the UK. Uh, I'll give you a bit of background on myself. So I've been working in simulation for probably getting on for certainly 25 years, maybe more than 25 years. Um, so I have a degree in mechanical engineering and I have a doctorate from the University of Manchester, which Romano is from. I don't know if you know that Romano, but uh, I, I did a doctorate at the University of Manchester finishing in 2000, uh, looking at multi-parameter structural optimization. So looking at so uh, researching um, shape optimization for nonlinear problems using genetic algorithm optimization techniques. Um, so it was quite a, uh, a novel area I was working in um, initially and uh, had to develop a lot of stuff that, that well, <laughs> we had to write a lot of code our own, ourselves and, and develop things because there wasn't much commercial off-the-shelf stuff for, for multi-parameter optimization in those days. Um, so after I took my doctorate, received my doctorate in 2000, I then worked in industry. Um, I worked in a, uh, a company that developed bespoke uh, FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods um, products. So a lot of research-based work, looking at the sort of things that, that people need for bespoke packaging um, uh, functions and, and operations. Uh, I, I worked on a, uh, a prototype machine that cost $1 million, and it was uh, a new concept in packaging microwave popcorn. So <laughs> it uh, sounds a fairly benign uh, topic but it was very uh, obviously very very detailed optimized uh, process we were trying to develop so i did that that role for a bit and then i stepped away from a user if you like in terms of uh, simulation capability and i took a job with msc software um so msc developed nastran uh, and Nastran is own well, basically is used in the bulk of all aerospace development programs. So uh, if you're designing an aircraft and you want to certify it with the CAA in Europe or the FAA in the States or various bodies, it's very likely you're going to be using Nastran for that, that work. So um, yeah, working with MSC, so I was involved in uh, technical support and training and some course development as well and then i moved from that role into uh, an application engineer with msc so going out to companies and looking at workflows and proposing um, you know improvements that they could make with their tool sets and their their general capabilities so lots of um, I, I was based in surrey in the south of england uh, west of london so lots of work with Formula One teams because the, the Formula One teams are all based, uh, well, effectively between London and Birmingham in the UK. So lots of work there, lots of aerospace work. Um, yeah, general apprenticeship, if you like, into pretty full on uh, FEA. Uh, so I worked there and then I stepped out from MSC again and I then went into the aerospace industry directly. So I worked with a number of companies. So that was probably from uh, 2005, 2006. Um, so working with uh, companies like BAE and Airbus and lots of companies in their supply chain uh, developing aircraft. So um, A380, the Airbus A380, the Super Jumbo um, was something that we were looking at. So in 2005, 2006, that was uh, going into what we call a check stress phase. So it was nearly ready to fly. Um, so we were getting that uh, 
get getting that work done. Um, the, my role there, or basically the, the the tier one supply that I was working with, we're looking at wing development. Uh, so we're doing lots of uh, leading edge, well, <laughs> physically leading edge and actually leading edge analysis work as well on on the on on that, that piece of structure. We we were using some very early topology optimization stuff to look at structural layout. So probably uh, when the very first early adopters in terms of that technology, uh, and then I moved on from the FSA 380 onto the uh, the joint strike the joint strike fighter as it was called then through BA Systems, um, working on the F 35. Uh, or the Lightning II project, so uh, you know the uh, high capability military aircraft that's used by many many different air forces around the world. Uh, lots of stealth capability, so we had to design structures uh, in composites that that were pretty revolutionary in terms of uh, where things were. And then stepped out of that after about three or four years, and then working with Airbus directly again uh, on the A three fifty. The, again, commercial uh, commercial uh, aircraft, uh, working with Airbus and with Spirit Aerosystems, uh, based in the UK, looking at uh, the full architecture of the both the structure but also the architecture of the FEA development process for um, for that kind of kind of structure. So lots of um, you know hundreds of thousands of load cases lots of what we call down selection in terms of determining critical load cases and then developing optimized structure off the back of those load cases and uh, all that good stuff. So that was up until uh, about six and a half, seven years ago. And then I stepped away from that again and formed EvoTech. Um, and I've been running EvoTech since then. And yeah, I've become a hexagon business partner. So a lot of work in their portfolio development in terms of uh, software deployment into the market, in terms of uh, direct services engagements, and also in online training development as well. Okay, um, Yusuf, you, you can hear me, okay? Just just to double check. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, a, a bit of time spent there, but I thought it was worthwhile to to give people a bit of background in terms of um, what what I'm what I'm about really. So yeah, that that's that's my background um i've just become a fellow of the institute of mechanical engineers and i've got um nafem's professional simulation engineer status at advanced level um and i've got that against i think there's about 25 different aspects of fea that that i've got that for so you know i've got a pretty wide ranging experience in in, in this kind of work so um that brings me on to today's topic. So we're going to be talking about an introduction to FEA with MSC Apex. Um, I'm going to assume that you don't know very much about Apex. Uh, maybe you do, but uh, I'm just going to give you some background. Um, I'm not going to go into huge amounts of demo and that kind of thing, but um, you, you, you'll, you'll get a good feel for what the product is, is about. Okay, so I'll just skip on to the to the first slide proper okay so the simulation market and, and and the way that simulation works across industry is pretty complex there's lots of people doing it uh and lots of people that that want to do it potentially okay so i mentioned hexagon the company that i'm partnered with they they acquired MSC software, the, the Nastran company, uh, and they set about um, surveying the market in terms of understanding where the problems are with uh, legacy methods, legacy software, legacy approaches to, to doing things. Um, so they saw that there are around 300,000 uh, simulation engineers in the world, there are 3 million engineers that could benefit in, in whatever form of work they're involved with. So through, through this work with, with um, Hexagon, they managed to get hold of 750 uh, senior engineers and managers um, acro 
spots across the, the globe and many different industries. I was actually involved in this piece of work on a uh, client or customer level, if you like, with the work I was doing with um, with Airbus and, and Spirit Aero Systems. Okay, but the, the, there are a number of key things that came out of this work, and I'll, I'll go through some of these things. So, one of the first things that came up was that legacy software and um, software tools there's a significant blocker in terms of its usability and, and learnability okay so just to quote some some figures that they pulled out of this this research saying that 50 percent of people need more than a month to learn uca software 60 percent of people lack the resources and the, the capability and the skills to interpret the results and then 85 percent see value in uh, engineers so not non-expert engineers using ca tools okay so yeah it can't be too prescriptive with these numbers but obviously that there, there was a there's a a blocker in terms of um, the ability that people have to use legacy tool sets okay the next thing that came up was that once people have got to grips with software tools they spend long or large amounts of time um, building models tuning models trying to get models to run uh, successfully um, so you can see here uh, lots of time on what we call geometry cleanup so this is effectively taking a CAD model or CAD data and bringing it into um, an FEA software environment and, and it not being fit for purpose so lots of um, edits and, and manipulation required here and then once you've got your model well where you think it will run you you've got a um, you know, there's a lot of effort in terms of tuning the model to, to one make it run and once it's running then to make it run uh, efficiently okay in terms of the capability of the software and, and the methods that people are using um, again issues with compatibility between different systems so matching physics and fidelity so uh, you, you might spend a long time building a linear fea model and then realize that actually you needed to look at certain aspects from a non-linear perspective and then spending huge amounts of time in terms of getting that stuff to work as well you know so um, uh, lots of lots of time wasted uh, same for mbd uh, mbd is multi-body dynamics so we're looking at uh, sort of the, the the motion and the kinematics of an assembly and mbd is a, obviously a big thing in in industries like the automotive industry looking at suspension systems and maybe aircraft landing gear um, so you know issues with compatibility there as well and then people saying that they benefit from a uh, a unified simulation environment so in other words you learn one tool and you can pull in all these different physics and technologies um, without having to use or learn uh, different interfaces time and time again okay and then finally and this is a big one and i see this i should see this massively in terms of aircraft development programs is that people would spend so long building getting successful analysis and then verifying the results that it was almost too late to change the design um so in many ways the fea just became a verification activity for um, the, the design that had already been sent for manufacture and only in very very difficult cases were you know uh, designs changed you know so if you can get the simulation earlier on in the design cycle then you're going to get ultimately better products and you're going to get them quicker uh with with less risk downstream okay so what is apex based on those numbers and, 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 and the general feeling from that survey um, people you know were obviously not particularly happy with the, the way that the market looked in terms of the tools they had access to so hexagon or msc as it was at the time took the view that they were going to build a new ca platform from the ground up and make it fit for purpose for the well let's say for the 21st century for the you know <laughs> um you know the, the the time frame that we're in now and you know in, into the future so they've come up with this this tool apex so i've got some videos running on the 
on the left hand side, um, just showing the type of models that, that people would be looking at. But Apex is based around what it is a, is a, con a very contemporary CA platform. Um, so there's it's got wide ranging capability across multiple functions, solution types. So we're just talking then about you know the, the, the pain that people were seeing in terms of going from a non-linear, sorry, a linear model into a non-linear model, uh, from a FEA model into a multi-body dynamics model, uh, maybe from an FEA model to a CFD type um, type approach. So you know they, they've they've tried to address some of these aspects with current releases, and and uh, they're putting a lot of work into into the future releases as well. The UX or the user experience or the user interface that they've developed, and we'll, we'll see this explicitly with a couple of more detailed demo videos that I'm going to be looking at. Um, we've got a, a game changing uh, UI. So it's it's pretty straightforward. So you can come in. I wouldn't say you can just pick it up without any, any training at all, but it's much, much more slick than some of the legacy tools that, that people were using in this industry. So easy to learn, easy to use. OK, and we've got very powerful CAD and external simulation interoperability. So that means that Apex will talk to um, CAD tools where designs are, well, legacy tools where they may have been developed and equally uh, the ability to uh, in, interoperate, if you like, with external simulation tools. So uh, other FEA solvers, um, you know, some of the legacy tools on the market, maybe you, you may have heard some of the, 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 the names of things like Abacus and Ansys and uh, various forms of Nastran um, uh, are now much, much more, much better catered for. Okay, this when we first started talking about productivity gains, this was a pretty contentious area to be looking at. Okay, um, effectively to, to be able to say we 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 can we can do your job ten times quicker using our tools. People, you know, either didn't believe you or thought you were skipping, skipping things. I, I actually did a, um, I'm involved with a company at the moment, and um, I've, I've done a demo workflow for them, and it, it, a piece of work that was taking them around three weeks, and I've actually been able to do the same job in three hours. So massive benefit in terms of um, productivity. Okay. And equally, because Apex has been designed from the ground up with this, this more contemporary user experience, people can get to grips with it with minimal um, background, if you like, in, in, in legacy tools. So the, the productivity comes through from uh, a number of things. So we've got what we call a generative model architecture. And I, I'll, I'll touch on this again in, in a lot more detail, uh, which basically means if you make a change to the model, such so as change the geometry or uh, move a faster or punch a hole in something, then the full model will update. So you don't need to go back in and start from scratch. You know, so big benefits there. Okay, we've got the concept of what we call engineering abstraction, which means that if you're a you know very very experienced simulation engineer and you want the you know the, the absolute detail in terms of your model development, you can work at that level. But equally if you're you know, just looking for an overall behavior or conceptual uh, understanding, then you can, um, you can control the, the, the fidelity or the abstraction within the model and make it much more simple for, for your, your um, requirements. We've got what we call incremental verification, which means that if you've got a large assembly, so something like an aircraft is a large assembly, then you can build parts and sub-assemblies within that full assembly in a manner you can verify their behavior as you're building before you get to the, the full definition. So you're not having to effectively use a sort of monolithic approach where you build a full model and then will it solve? And those days are long gone. Um, so massive benefit there in terms of right first time simulation uh, approach. And then we've also got uh, automation. So there's a, there's a very capable Python API. So lots of uh, Apex specific functionality written into that API. So they allow you to, um, to automate as needs be. Okay. The Apex platform, I don't know, you may have heard me 
speaking with Yosef at the beginning, um, talking about some of the companies who are sponsoring Apex development. Apex is used in lots of places around the world, uh, lots of different industries, automotive, aerospace, automotive, um, doing a lot of work with shipbuilding, um, general vehicle development. Um, yeah, the, lots and lots of products are, are now reliant on Apex in terms of their, their development and companies are, are benefiting from the productivity gains that, that we can see. So again, somewhat linked to the abstraction thing I was, I was talking about, that, that there are many different uh, personas, if you like, or types of person or types of engineer that, that would be um, would be using Apex. So it you know, works nicely with uh, new new users and non-specialists, uh, CA generalists, so people you know doing FEA all the time, uh, and also third-party CA specialists, so people that are looking at uh, different types of simulations, so CFD, multi-body dynamics, uh, multi-physics, all that sort of stuff. Um, so lots of capability there. Right, so let me show you some of the key technologies. Is you still there, Yosef? Any, any questions come in so far, anybody? No, no questions nope. so far. Okay, good stuff. Okay, well, I'll, I'll carry on with this next slide then. So some of the key technologies that have enabled this capability are, again, the, the fact that the user experience, or rather you know, the, the, the software um, has been built from the ground up you know, in a very, very contemporary manner. So very easy to, to learn and use. Pretty much every function in the Apex environment has an embedded video to support its, its usage. Um, so you can, if you've forgotten how to do something, you can just go through and find, find the function that, that, um, that you want to use and then just maybe 30, 30 or 60 second video and refresh yourself in terms of uh, how, how that might work. There's lots of dedicated online training, um, and that's one thing that uh, my company EvoTech specialise in is online training uh, for a number of different levels um, using the Apex environment, and that's been very, very successful and very busy. Um, so during lockdown, we had um, the first couple of months of lockdown, we had about 300 engineers through our Apex training program, um, twiddling their thumbs, wanted to learn something new and taking on uh, this, this new capability, okay? Lots of different companies involved in, in that. Apex is underpinned um, through something called direct modeling, okay? So direct modeling is a, uh, a form of geometry manipulation, uh, what we call the geometry kernel that, that, that sits underneath the, or there's like a, an engine within the Apex environment. And it's been configured specifically for uh, computer aided engineering, so FEA type um, type problems. So um, looking at uh, things like CAD to mesh. So obviously, for, for an FEA model, you need a, a well defined mesh strategy or mesh to come out uh, to be able to use the model. So in the past, I've touched on it briefly, but you, you'd get a CAD model from uh, you know, either you create it yourself or it'd come from a design team and there'd be lots of work uh, in terms of building that, that geometry up in, in, a, in a means that, that we, can, we can mesh it. We've got automated property generation. And again, I'm, I'm going to cover some of this stuff in, the, in a video in a moment, but just, just to give you some background to this. So uh, if, you've, if you've developed your, um, your mesh, so it might be a, a 1D, beam mesh or a two-dimensional shell mesh, or even a, a 3D solid mesh, um, we can develop the properties, so the sections or the thicknesses from the underlying CAD model. So that, that again, that's a big, a big, um, a big step in, in terms of efficiency, okay? And, and the, the other thing as well, lots of things that direct modeling mean or, or can do, but I just picked out a um, handful here. One, one aspect, which is, sort of showing a lot of potential and people are using this a fair bit is the ability to turn legacy legacy mesh data into CAD. So let, let's say you've got um, a, a, a simulation department or analysis department 
with a, an FEA model from some time ago, and you want to manipulate that model, you can turn that original model back into CAD, and then you can um, you, you know you can start the, the model build process from from there. The, the legacy mesh to CAD, um, I've I've done a few things with this um, in terms of legacy FEA models, but I've also been involved with looking at um, physical scan data. So it's effectively a point cloud or a mesh that describes the, the architecture of a, of, a, of a part or an assembly and bring that, that mesh data, if you like, into the Apex environment, turn it, turn it back into CAD and then uh, developing the, the simulation from that. Okay. We've got, again, touch on this briefly in the, in the previous slide, but we've got uh, what we call generative model updates. So pretty simple example shown here, but and again, we'll, we'll touch on this with a demo video in a second. But if you've got a piece of geometry uh, that's been meshed up and you've got your FEA based properties and materials defined on that model in the old, in the old days, using legacy tools, if you wanted to um, change the, the topology or maybe even in this case, so we've got the original um, component on the left and the modified component on the right, the modified component has got a hole punched out of the, you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor, Joseph? Yep, I can. Yeah, okay. So on this on this right-hand side, we may have a requirement to look at a structure with a, with a change to it. So a change to the mesh, the properties, uh, the materials, the, the loading and the boundary conditions. So this generative model update means that we can just make a quick change and everything downstream from that, so the meshing, again, the properties, the, the um, thicknesses, the, the, the sections, uh, all of that stuff will be updated automatically. Uh, we've got the ability to replace parts within the model. So um, if we've got two CAD models, which are quite similar, then we, we don't need to build the FEA model for one, one uh, representation of the CAD, and we can switch it out with a new shape and the um we call it part replace so so the, the the cad is then referenced by the new geometry and and the simulation model is is taken care of okay embedded and external solver workflow so i mentioned that apex is a uh, complete uh, cae platform so that means you can build an fea model in apex you can solve it in apex and you can look at the results in Apex as well. Uh, we've also got the ability to interact with uh, what we call external solvers. So uh, if you had um, maybe a Nastran um, on a high, a Nastran installation on a high performance computing um, server or something, or you wanted to look at a specific Nastran solution sequence that isn't supported by Apex or the, the, the embedded Apex solver, you can simply export the model to the Nastran environment and run that externally, and then bring the results back into, into the, the Apex environment. So, so we call that, uh, the model build we call pre-processing, then we have solution and the result exploration we call post-processing. So we can do po pre and post in Apex, but we can choose where we want to do this, the solution. And that, that that's useful if a company has maybe a third party um, solver. So I mentioned things like Abacus and Ansys um, that, that companies might want to use. You can still get the benefit of the efficiency gains in terms of building the model, but then you would export the model into the, the Abacus or Ansys environment to, to take advantage of their, their capability, okay? We've got what we call two-way CAD integration. So I mentioned uh, the CA specific direct modeling. So because Apex is such a powerful geometry engine underneath or underpinning the, the model build and the model uh, manipula manipulation and development, that um, we can represent CAD geometry in a, in a very, um, uh, really, in a really good manner, uh, really, um, really powerful way, I should say. So that there's, there's two facets to that. We can import CAD uh, very cleanly. So 
uh, we have what we call native formats. So that would be, we can read direct CAD data. So things like SolidWorks or AutoCAD Inventor or um, uh, Katia or Creo or any of those um, CAD tools that, that are on the market, we can read their data in. We can also read what we call translator formats. So translator format would be things like Parasolid or Step or IGIS, where they've it's not native data, it's actually um, coming in in a sort of third party format. Uh, STL, which is the scan data that I was talking about, we can we can bring in. Um, we can make a change in Apex. You might run a simulation model, update the geometry. You, you can then take that geometry back into the the um, uh, the CAD environment. So I don't know how much work the, the you know, everyone on the call has done looking at CAD, but you can have a sort of um, hierarchy of parts and assemblies in in, the, in your CAD environment, and Apex will respect that coming in, importing, and going back out, exporting as well. So you could be the the CAD designer's best friend if you're um, manipulating geometry for the for that that kind of workflow. Okay. Uh, and then I touched on this earlier well, briefly, but uh, we've got really strong automation and customization capabilities. So the, the Python API is, is, is a really good workhorse in terms of uh, stuff that we can do in the Apex environment. So we can, uh, we can record macros and replay those macros. We can take that recorded script and modify it and then uh, parameterize a model potentially, or we can you know, start from scratch a blank piece of paper and actually use Python to, to write a, um, uh, a, a custom tool that, that could be locked into the Apex environment. We call these utilities. And in, in, in the general Apex releases, there will be utilities that have been developed by engineers who are using Apex and have seen a need to do something specific for, for their problem. And those tools have, have sort of migrated their way back into Apex um, as, as a series of user-defined functions that, that people can use. Okay. So yes, if I'm, I'm about to play a demo, so let me know if this doesn't work, but I'm, I'm hoping it does. Okay. So I've got, a, I think it's about 13, 14 minutes overview of some of the key Apex technologies. So that, just to give you a bit of background, I, uh, recorded these demos this morning and wanted to do them via video uh, rather than live in case we run into any difficulties but I hope you get you get the gist of what we're trying to do here okay so just running through a handful of the the uh, the aspects here so looking at user experience first of all so th so this is the apex environment okay so a very clearly well laid out environment this, this is just a demo model uh, of a drone that I use so on the top right hand ribbon and then down the bottom you can go right down the right hand side you can see the functionality that we can pop out as as and when as as and when we need it we've got the model browser tab on the left hand side so we can hold a lot of information in the, uh, in, the in the user environment without having to have lots of forms open at any one time okay we can switch from what we call light mode into dark mode. I mean, this is a pretty contemporary thing these days and I've used in lots of pieces of software, but I personally prefer to work in dark mode. Uh, I think models are better and it's, it's better on my eyes, um, but I just wanted to show you the light mode um, to get started. Okay, so in the browser on the left-hand side, you can see we've got our assembly architecture. So this. This drone assembly is made up of lots of different parts. So we can turn on and off and manipulate the, the view of each one of those parts and, and sub-assemblies very easily. Uh, we, can, um, we can change the, the, the sort of view, um, the view type, if you like, so we can make uh, aspects, wireframe, rendered, um, transparent, all that sort of stuff, you know. So, Pretty standard stuff from a CAD perspective, but not often the case, not always the case in, a, in an FEA or CA type environment. Okay. So lo lots of capability here. In terms of the specific functions that we've got to operate on a model, 
So here we can just hover over function and then play a video to show us how that function is going to work. So this is uh, one of the mid surfacing aspects. So we can we can look at that video and remind ourselves of what uh, what's involved. We've also got text based instruction as well. So going back to that usability survey that I touched on the very first slide, there's some pretty um, big changes in terms of capability, uh, you know, thinking about the, the, the user environment. Okay, uh, Things like element quality, so really nice display to be able to see have we got any elements which are poorly shaped or areas of concern, so we can turn those displays on and off very quickly and control the things like the meshing and the connections between parts very easily. So just looking at a couple of other displays here, so what we call the shell normals, and the, the element uh, coordinate frames. So have a quick look at a direct modeling example, probably running through this quite quickly, but you, you get the idea. So if we, if we look at a part that's being imported from CAD, so this is quite a thin walled section. So what we're going to do is use a technique called mid surfacing, whereby we effectively generate a, a surface through the thickness of a 3D CAD model, okay? So we're just picking the faces of the solid that we want to mid surface. And then the surfaces is, surface has been generated in green. Okay. So without going through too much detail here, just picking out the, the areas that we, that we want to address. Uh, what you can't really tell is that there's minimal mouse interaction going on here. So didn't, don't really have to use the keyboard while we're doing this stuff at all. Just literally pick and then use the middle mouse button to to select and and the operations are are taken care of okay so we're just running through picking the faces that we we want to develop this this mid surface on and then we can uh, just run our way around and see the different surfaces as they're generated okay so just picking the last one there so that all those mid surfaces are now created, and that's all a function of this direct geometry modeling that I was talking about. Okay, so really nice, slick way of handling geometry um, for meshing. Right? So we've got lots of surfaces generated. We're now going to use another tool. We're just simply going to extend all these surfaces together. And uh, Apex is looking for. Uh, or proximity of, of edges and faces, and then it snaps everything together. Okay, we can see based on this color code how the uh, connections have been generated. I'm just going to change the color here. Now, in this top region here, or right, well, in the bottom region, first of all, it's quite a simple structure, so the geometries come together nicely. We do need to make some edits in this top region. Okay, so we're going to use uh, a couple of um, drag and push pull type uh, operations here so literally we just drag a point or drag a face or drag a, an edge and those changes get washed through the model okay uh, we've got an area here that's not really going to work from a mid-surface perspective based on the original mid-surface algorithm so we're just going to create some geometry between the the flat upper face and then this curved region here Okay, so we're just going to delete the faces that could be problematic. And then we're going to create a new surface, a new, a new pair of faces, if you like, between these two edges. Okay, so super quick way of manipulating geometry. Okay, this red curved edge here doesn't meet up with anything. So we're just simply going to drag it across and close the gap and the geometry is ready to go. Okay. We're going to mesh the geometry. So again, we can look at the I think we can look at the element quality next. Is that right? Yeah. So we've got this element quality index that shows us if we've got good, poor, or bad quality elements. So we can see here we've got this orange element, and we can again use those direct modeling tools just to move geometry around, shuffle geometry to get the form that we want uh, in this representation. Okay. Uh, we've got 
quite a, an irregular mesh in this face here. So we're going to split the surface using a point to point splitting operation. And then update, and then the geometry and the underlying mesh is updated. Okay, so pretty straightforward means of, of developing the geometry in the mesh. We can develop the what we call the shell thicknesses. So we can use the original CAD form to calculate the equivalent thickness of the shells which uh, sit underneath the um, underneath the solid geometry, and then we can check that those thicknesses have come across as we wish. Uh, there's this little problem here in this red region where the thickness has been calculated incorrectly by uh, there's some fillets in the geometry that's caused the problem here. So we can manually update those thicknesses and the shell definition will, will uh, be defined as, as we want it. So we, again, we can double check, double check the uh, equivalent thickness for those shell elements. Apologies if you've not done too much FEA work, whether some of these terms are new to you, uh, but we can see we've got the, the thickness matching the underlying CAD in a very nice, clean manner. Okay. And then we can move on. I think we're going to use some of the, uh, yeah, we're going to uh, verify this part using the, using the inbuilt Apex solver. So we're going to run the normal modes analysis. So this is just like a, a vibration analysis on, on the structure. Apex will tell us if we've got any problems. It's highlighted that we failed to define the material density properly. So we need to add in the material density. We can put values in in any unit system that we like, and then Apex will convert those, uh, those values to the uh, implicit system that, that we've specified. And then we can run our simulation and uh, look, at the, look at the output. So this is just a check to verify that the part is doing what we, what we want it to do. And then this might, might be used to make up a much larger or use as a part within a much larger assembly uh, for the for the overall definition. We've got this um, this function or this functionality based on what we call generative update. So again, we've got the shell representation of the structure defined nicely. Uh, we may have a scenario where the underlying CAD model gets updated. Okay, so we can just look at this uh, this blue CAD representation. And we've got a hole that's been cut in there. There may be some uh, some wiring or something that needs to go through there. So we're just going to re, or rather, look at the the new structure based on the modification with this this um, this cutout. Okay, so we're just going to turn the CAD into transparent mode, and then we're going to split the underlying definition based on the the new CAD geometry. Okay, so. We're going to pick the edges of this internal uh, surface and then use that to split the underlying mesh. Okay. And then we can see that the, the mesh has been updated and then we can delete the face that's been created. Simply delete that. We've now got the hole in the structure. The mesh in that region looks a little bit ragged, should we say? Um, so we can, we can update the mesh using a, a slightly smaller element edge length and try and improve the, the shape of the, the, the square or the quad elements around the hole. And then we can double check the, the thickness and show that those updates have been washed all the way through the model. So with that pretty, um, well, it's significant change to the CAD, we've, had to, well, we've not had to do very much with the underlying model at all, okay? So we can run the simulation for the structure that's got the hole in it. And then we can look at the results. And Apex is, is pretty nice in the sense that it can retain the history of the models that we've been looking at. So we can compare the, the approach that's been, um, that we've tested there, okay? Uh, Yosef, I just wondered if there were any questions on that, the demo, I, I know I ran through that pretty quickly. Mm, one, one comment, uh, graphical user interface looks very clean and simplified. Most scientific computing software have a complicated user interface, which I agree. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, I, I'm used to Apex now, so I don't really see that see the uh, you know the, the the major advantages. It's only when I go back to something else that I I, I start to cry. You know, uh, but no, it, it's been designed from the ground up, and there's a lot of really good design in terms of FEA based functionality, but also in terms of the user experience as well. So that's a that's a that's a good comment and uh, you know an important one. Okay, so just a quick example here in terms of something that we, a piece of work that I did with a, a client company, and, and this, this has been published in the public domain, so we can talk about it. So a, a services company based in the northwest of the UK, Airframe Designs, who have a, a design and simulation team, they were looking at um, effectively investing in Apex and wanted to understand what it would do for them compared with legacy tools. So they, they, they're heavily involved in the aircraft interiors market. So the seat structures, galley structures, all that sort of stuff. Um, they, they build or they, they have a, a model which they, they look at time and time again for different clients, which is this, what they call a monument structure. So that, that curved structure can be moved in the aircraft based on the, um, the, the airline's um, layout. Or the, the aircraft layout and and they're, they're repeating these models so they want a quick way of of building the models and then um, updating them based on, on user requirement so put this graph together a lot of information in this graph but what we did was compared four different ca tools um, the tool on the left is a tool called patran which is an msc tool uh, we can name that without getting any legal hot water. And then the, 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 the tool on the right is, is MSC Apex, of course. We've got um, toolset A and toolset B in between, uh, two very well-known um, CA-based or simulation-based pre and post processes and solvers. Um, obviously, <laughs> I can't name them explicitly, but we looked at the build process um, from uh, bringing geometry in through to, to getting results. Uh, and we, we, we also built in the, uh, the requirement to update these models. And we actually looked at three, three updates. One thing I would say here is that the, we, we used a couple of subcontract uh, people to support this, this study. And for Patran and for Tulsa A and B, we used engineers who had significant experience in, in, in these tools. The Apex study, was done with done by people who were pretty fresh graduates, didn't have a lot of experience in other tools, had some fundamental training in Apex, but um, you know certainly didn't have the 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 the, the time if, if you like in front of a, a screen that the other guys had. And you can see clearly that there's you know there's a big a big um, efficiency gain that that, um, that that we saw. I, I think I quoted the the 10x improvements. There are certainly aspects of the, the, the FEA process which are massively improved in efficiency with Apex. Um, some, some things that aren't, but obviously, you know, in, 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 its, um, in the sum, if you like, of the hours, we can see the, the, the benefit that, that we've got there. Okay. So I think this is my last slide, and we've got probably got about 10 minutes left. So I want, I want to try and make sure we've got time for questions. So I just want to go through some of the training that, that we've got. So I mentioned Eva Tecca uh, heavily involved in Apex based online training. So we've currently got an intro to FEA with MSC Apex course. Uh, th this is all built on a enterprise level learning management tool. Uh, we've got, um, well, this focus on the fundamentals of Apex. So got no experience in FEA or you've been using other tools you can you can do this there's 12 hours of on-demand video and a whole bunch of tutorial and real world examples you can look at uh, and you get access for one year and this will give you a good good foundation in the tool course I've just built just finished so the chat with Yosef at the beginning of the the, uh, the call on this one so this this is um, a more um, advanced version of uh, course aimed at non-linear FEA with MSC Apex. Uh, again, same uh, type of uh, learning management tool, uh, similar length in terms of video and uh, tutorial and examples. 
again, uh, your bunyer of access. Nonlinear FEA is <laughs> is a completely different subject in its own right. So I wouldn't even begin to, to cover what nonlinear means in, in, in simple terms. And then finally, again, another one, another course that, that we've got available is the Apex Intro course. But this is for an academic version. So I'm going to run through this. This is pretty belated, but the pricing is 550 for the professional intro course. 550 for the professional nonlinear course, and then $120 for the, um, the academic course. And one really good aspect of this is that it comes with a free MSc Apex student edition license. So if you're if you're in academia um, and you want to learn FEA with a best in class tool, you've got everything you need in that in that package. Okay. So, hope that wasn't too blatant. <laughs> um, any questions? That I, I've, I've put my contact details down there, so you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, my URL for the website, and also my email address if you if you want to get in touch directly. Okay. Nice. Yes. Sir. Cool. Thank you so much. Really, really insightful, um, guys. If you have any questions, put them in the chat, and then we'll we'll take them one by one. I, I, I can't, well, I don't think I can see the chat easily, Joseph, so I don't know if you want to. I, I'll let you know really once. Yeah. Yeah, okay.